Okay. We're recording. Good. Okay. So, Gavin Reese, Dr. Gavin Reese, um, thank you for for agreeing to be my my first um, guinea pig. Um, although you look remarkably like a human, which is fantastic. Although you've got a very strange accent, which sometimes I find I struggle to understand, but it may not just be the accent. Um, I. I um, I believe that you're from across the ditch originally, and that you did your undergraduate and uh, PhD over there. But I, I only know you as a sort of freshwater scientist. We've worked together at what was the Murray Darling Freshwater Research Centre, is now the Centre for Freshwater Ecosystems, and from CSIRO. Where, how did you? Where did you start off? Where was your beginnings in 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 the scientific world? And um, nice to be here, by the way, Paul. <laughs> it's a, the, the pleasure is, is, is all mine. <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, so, yeah, look, when I started out <clears throat> at university, I had, a, I had a really broad interest, I guess, in science. And um, I knew from the science world, I, I, my interests were more in the, in the natural world. So I had a particular interest in biology. Um, but I also liked... I found interesting some of the chemistry sides of things. So not the pure hardcore chemistry, but but how um, sort of some reaction how, and, and how some chemical things actually happen. Um, but I, I really started out not having a clue which direction I wanted to go. And it wasn't until I got into the second year of, of the university uh, course that I was doing, which at, at University of Waikato, you kind of started out with a very general base understanding and then and specialised as you went along. And then when I got into my second year of university, I was able to do a range of other courses. And that's when I actually first did microbiology. And when what, I actually- what, what, was, what was, for me, microbiology and anything I couldn't really see at that stage was, was really difficult to get my head around because it just didn't make any sense. But why did it attract you? Well, mostly because I didn't know very much about it. So, the other courses, you know, the classic biology courses, you can do a zoology and you know about animals, mm, mm. botany, you know about plants. Um, and biochemistry and microbiology were kind of tagged together. So it was, it was biology, but it was related a bit more closely to chemistry and how that, how that sort of things worked. So I didn't really know a lot about microbiology when I enrolled in the course. But when I started doing the course, I'd have to say that of of all of the lecturers that I ever had through my entire university um, career and, and all the courses, the two guys that actually ran the microbiology um, courses uh, throughout the, the thing were, were really, I guess they were, they were pretty inspirational kind of um, teachers. So they were really interested in this subject. They were enthused. They introduced us to new worlds that we we knew, you knew about bacteria, but you didn't know much about what they did. This seems, them. this seems to be a very common thing. I mean, it was the same for me. It seems to be a very common thing that you, you perhaps didn't have a particular idea about what you wanted to do, but you were inspired by a, a teacher at the university with their enthusiasm for their topic. Yeah, and I, I even now recall like their style of, of teaching. So the, um, the couple of the guys who used to teach it, so... What were their names? Do you remember that? Hugh Morgan, Professor yeah. Hugh Morgan was one of them at the time. And the other one was uh, Chris Harfoot. I ended up doing my, um, I did a master's, the way the Waikato's structure went, is, is you did a master's and PhD rather than um, an honours program, which is the way you tend to do it here. Yeah. Um, but I ended up, Chris actually ended up being my PhD supervisor. And, um, and so, you know, I sort of, I, I was captivated enough by the sorts of worlds that they were talking about. Um, one, thing I, I, one, one thing I want to capture with sort of some of these interviews is is some of the history of and the people who are who were you know in, uh, going down through the ages and through the generations and who have have influenced um, current sort of uh, freshwater biologists, biologists more generally. So, um, if you've got some names there of people who influenced you, that's that's I'm keen to hear about them. Yeah, well, um, I. As, as a side thing, I, once I got quite interested in microbiology, so I, in, in the end, after, after I 
done a few of um, you know a few months of the course, I was just really intrigued by microbes, and I was way more interested in in like the diversity. I was so at an early early stage of, of microbiology, I was, like I was hugely captured by the diversity of life that is microscopic, and the biochemical processes, the things that microbes do, is infinitely more variable and and interesting and I found it a lot more interesting I like I rather cynically I sort of talk to you know when I talk to, to botanists or zoologists I say well look, you know a tree is a tree and that's pretty much the same as another plant they mm. do the same kinds of stuff mm. whereas whereas in the microbial world you've got photosynthetic microbes you've got bacteria that can live with oxygen without oxygen you can find bacteria um, doing really fascinating biochemistry in the bottom of the oceans ones so, inside your guts are completely different to the ones on your skin and so just maybe, can i just stop you there and and, and um because there'll be people listening to this watching this who who that doesn't mean a lot to them perhaps <clears throat> so uh animals and uh, and plants um animals respire um take in oxygen and give off pretty much carbon dioxide and plants do both but at different times the day and night so what are you talking about when you talk about microbes not doing the normal sort of stuff well certainly some of them do some some microbes carry out exactly the same process that we do we get they get their energy the same same kind of way we do um, but there are a group of uh, bacteria that actually carry out photosynthesis so people would know of blue green algae for example so there are there are two Broadly, there are two kind of groups of algae, um, greens and, and, and a collection of, of other things associated with them. But these things that everyone calls blue-green algae are actually bacteria. And they've got exactly the same photosynthetic system as plants. Why, why do we call them algae when they're actually bacteria? What's, what does it make back in, the, back in the early days, so these things are, these things are named a hundred years ago, a couple of hundred years ago, and they weren't known as bacteria then. In fact, probably around about that time, you know, bacteria were really not not as well understood or studied. So these things were small; they were microscopic. They were green. They looked like algae. So let's call them algae. They're a sort of a bluey, greeny colour. So they're, they're basically blue green microscopic plants. Right. But we now know that that they're much more closely related to to. Um, so it's just a it's just a legacy thing that we're hanging on to. Yeah. Them. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, so what I really, I found really, really interesting with um, microbiology and, and that kind of stirred, stirred me in this other direction is in a world devoid of oxygen, there are umpteen millions of different types of bacteria that can make a living in the absence of oxygen. So what sort uh, of environments is you, you're talking about the microbiome in your gut that they, they do that there? So the gut, yeah, the gut was one of the, the gut was one of the first areas where people really started seriously trying to understand the anaerobic world. And in fact, one of the one of the, the big groups of, of guys that um fell by the name of Rob Hungate, he he really perfected all of the earliest studies. And what he actually worked on was the cow rumen. So the rumen in the in the cow is an anaerobic stomach. It's just basically a big anaerobic fermenter. And he was one of the first people to be able to take that kind of material from from the um, rumen of a cow and he developed all of these techniques where he could actually grow these microbes up so what you might have seen with, with normal let's call them traditional aerobic kind of bacteria you will have seen them on a petri dish you know people mm. can plate and they grow them and they put them on the surface you can't do that if you, you you're killed by oxygen so he developed all of these techniques and he discovered a whole range of microorganisms or bacteria in, in the in the gut and once he was able to do that people used those techniques and they discovered just a huge range of bacteria that that make a living in the absence so of that, do they so those do we know where the, where those um those bacteria originally came from i mean in the sense that if they're anaerobic without oxygen did they um evolve that evolve within the, the stomachs of cows or did they well, they, were, they were predated cows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's been evolution since since cows yeah. have been around, but 
so somehow they ended up, they, they started off outside cows anaerobically and ended up in the cow stomachs. Yeah, look, I, <laughs> off, the top of my, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't really tell you when, when it's generally thought um, sort of the, the, the various pathways went and, and um, ferment, fermentation kinds of pathways took over. Because um, I'm not, I sort of haven't really looked at that. But did bacteria beat, I mean, look, this is showing my ignorance and I apologise because I'm sort of a bit of a bucket biologist dealing with just fishy type things, but do bacteria, do they predate on Earth? The presence of they, oxygen, they, oxygen they started they started it they started they, it they, they, they can started you explain it. can you explain it's impossible <laughs> for you to explain i know we're going back in time a fair <laughs> way we went we started off with your career and now we're going back a few billion years probably before that <laughs> um can you just explain briefly about how that works so yeah look um <laughs> not, you now, not, not in detail because because bacteria I'm, 101 I, I i wasn't i wasn't there so i, I can't can't really recall, um, but but so some of the earliest life forms they are, they are the single single celled life forms, and and the originally the Earth would have been devoid of oxygen, and what really kicked it off was the the capacity for oxygen to be generated, and that's when the, you know the whole process of of um, single celled organisms generating oxygen, slow pathway of producing more oxygen, creating an environment. Um, and as the environment would have changed chemically, what ultimately happens with with bacteria, like any other living thing, is they will they will adapt to the condition. So if an environment changes, it basically selects for the things that can grow in it. And and as microbes would have been selected to survive in that environment, and as that environment changed and, and diversity of environments occurred, then then those environments just selected for the types of organisms that can survive there so when you look at it now um, while while you will find some bacteria distributed all around the place generally the environment now created by soil for example selects for a, a particular group of bacteria that really prefer to live in soil and even when you get into the soil environment and a plant grows down and its and its roots basically work its way through um, the soil profile you'll find different organisms now being selected to grow in and around uh, the roots of plants to those that are free living in soil um, and they're different from the ones that you find in water environments and they're the other ones they'll be different from the ones that you find on the bottom sediments and they're certainly all different to to, to any other environment and that, that's what i think is the pretty cool thing with um, microbiology is in the big world, we sort of think different environments select for different creatures to grow. Mm -hmm. But we look at it at a really macro scale. We talk about soil and we talk about leaves and, mm -hmm. and, and water. Whereas on on um, on a human body, for example, you'll find different microorganisms grow in the moist areas around your nose compared to the skin organisms and those that are inside you and those that are on your teeth and those that are on your throat. They're all at the microscopic world, those environments are different enough to select the different kinds of organisms to to grow and develop, basically. Oh, right. Look, and that's the sort of the sort of stuff I find really interesting with with microbiology compared to the the bigger stuff. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So let's get back to your um, early career. <laughs> I, think, I think we're working around that. That's okay. Um, so you're in second year, or I think it's second year, is it? Um, yep. Uh, influenced by these inspirational microbiologists. So what happens after that? <clears throat> so I I went through um, the undergraduate days, and and I I got to the end of I guess my third year, and then had to decide which which why I would go and I, I was quite interested in doing further um, further education mm -hmm. I really again I didn't really have my, I didn't have my career plotted out I didn't say I wanted to be a research scientist at that stage I, I had no idea I was doing what I did because I enjoyed it I found it interesting and yeah, if I could get a job doing that kind of thing that would be good um, what so, did you think you were going to do though with that? I mean, did you know what where microbiology can lead at that or could lead at that stage? So I, I did. Didn't you think about it that much? No, I, I had thought about it a little bit. So at, in in Hamilton, which is where the University of Waikato is, it's in the Central North Island, and right next to our university campus was a very large 
um, agricultural uh, research facility. Lots of cow stomachs there. Lots of, funny <laughs> you should say that, lots and lots of cow stomachs. Um, and there's a lot of energy. And, and again, the Central North Island area is, is very much dairy in country. And so there's a lot of research going on there with optimizing milk production, um, beef, if it happened to be for, for, um, beef, uh, for meat. Um, then of course there was also pasture research because pasture has a big part in, in, in mm. how's, how cows survive and the types of milk and the quality of milk and all that sort of thing. So I was certainly aware of Ruakura, which was mm. the research station. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew some of the sorts of things they did there. And I thought, well, if I could eventually get enough of a degree behind me, um, that might be the sort of place where I would work. Um, at that stage, I was kind of thinking, look, if I can get a job as a technician there, I'd be, I'd be kind of interested in doing that. I hadn't really mm -hmm. thought about a research career until I actually was well into my PhD. So how did you, um, ha um, so you finished your undergraduate and you went on a bit of, you were going to do a master's, so you went on to do a master's. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and was that, so that project was a, a research master's completely. Yep. And was that a choice of yours or did, was it existing yep. or what? And what was it on? Tell us a, bit, a little so, bit about that. Actually, um, yeah, it was completely my, my subject. So my, my, my topic. Cow stomachs? Um, sorry? Did it involve cow stomachs? No, it didn't. It didn't involve cow stomachs. I did briefly play with cow stomachs, but, but I, I shifted to another group of anaerobic bacteria. And um, at the time, um, there's, a, there's a particular group of anaerobic bacteria. They've got this long, torturous name called sulfate-reducing bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and just to explain a little bit about them in, in sort of simple terms is they are anaerobic bacteria. If you, they don't grow in, in the presence of oxygen. They're actually killed by oxygen. And... You, you possibly are aware of or heard of or certainly experienced methanogenic bacteria, so mm -hmm. methane producing mm -hmm. bacteria. They are um, part of the microbial food chain, as it were, and they're right at the end of it. They mop up all of the chemicals and produce methane. Do we get them from in decomposing wetlands and yeah. material yeah. stuff? Right. So those, those, those bacteria, the methanogens, those microbes, um, in, in decomposing um, sediments and in wetlands mm -hmm. are very similar to the ones inside humans and inside oh. cows producing the vast amounts of methane. Mm -hmm. So they're sitting there doing their stuff. Um, but in an environment where there's a little bit of sulfate and, and probably the most common place you'll find that is in marine environments. So marine, is, marine environments got salt uh, sodium chloride and calcium and magnesium. Mm -hmm. You also have sulfate. As soon as you have a little bit of sulfate in an anaerobic environment, the sulfate reducing bacteria are much better at mopping up all of those compounds that the methanogens would use and they outcompete. They outcompete the methanogens and they grow. <clears throat> the thing with, with um, sulfate reducers is their end product is actually hydrogen sulfide gas. So instead of CH4, which is methane, the rotten egg these gas, bugs produce H2S, which is rotten egg gas. All right. Horrible and, stuff. And um, so when I was uh, a student, not as much was known about the variety of, of these sulfate reducers. I'll call them SRBs because it's mm -hmm. easier to get mm -hmm. out. Um, and so I, I started a project with um, my then supervisor and we were actually playing with samples back then from a permanently stratified frozen lake from Antarctica. What's, what, is a, what is a permanently stratified lake okay. from Antarctica? So... <laughs> I, <laughs> I know where I, Antarctica is. I, I was unlucky enough not to get to Antarctica, but my supervisor did. So in, in some areas of um, Antarctica, there, there are some lakes in this particular mm -hmm. lake. I had my samples from it's called Lake Frixel. They have a permanent ice sheet over them. It's right. been covering that, that lake for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And all the way through the water column, the chemistry really hasn't been able to change much. And so the top of the lake has got oxygen in it. But mm -hmm. once you get to a little bit further down the water column, 
the oxygen is all devoid. There's where, no is it, oxygen where does the oxygen from uh, that top layer come from, if there's ice on it? Oh, it's probably got enough, enough of it has, has been in there and, and mopped up, enough little bit of light gets through. I think there's even some really, really slow processes that can actually happen um, at, at the top. Diffu diffusion of oxygen through the, not through the ice. Surely. But but once but once it would have been in there, yeah. Okay. 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 So um, it, it it's often not as it's not like um you know you would think of as a as a lake here where there's a very very long section of water column where there's oxygen. And, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you if you looked at one of the big reservoirs where you might have tens of meters of oxygenated water, these things it's just don't the top really, they they can be quite small. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, at depth, there's um, there's no oxygen, and and the world is is bacterial, and the sulfate reducers have a role there. It's just kind of a quirky set of sites that my supervisor was working on, and he said, wouldn't it be fun if we could we could find out what sorts of um, sulfate reducing bacteria we could find in this kind of environment? And so, did you find some new species of bacteria from there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you did name them. Uh, those ones, I kind of. I, di I didn't worry about naming them there because they were sort of similar enough to the things that had been found. But subsequent to that, I've I've um, named or discovered or named quite a few. How many have you named? Oh, wow. oh a dozen or so. Any ones you want to name after me, maybe in the future? <laughs> <laughs> Some well, particular, particularly unattractive, um, <laughs> annoying bacteria that for whatever reason. Yeah, well, have a think about it. Maybe it's something. I will. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take. I'll, I'll make a note over here. Okay. I mean, there, there is a quite a long history of people naming species um, after people they don't like. Yeah. For various reasons. That's a, that's a t another story. Um. So go on. You you. So you got these sulfur ju reducing these SRBs from yep. from Antarctica. How do you how do you bring them back from back to, uh, from bacteria from Antarctica? Uh, in ways that you can actually study them. What, what's the process of actually retrieving them and bringing them back? Very briefly, I'm sure that there's a lot of detail there. Couldn't, couldn't be easier. All you have to do is take some mud and put it in a completely filled jar. So okay. right to the top, screw cap on, and that sample, if refrigerated, will remain, and the microbes, the bacteria will remain alive in that for a long time. And you can do the same with water. You can just grab a water sample. As long as the, the container is completely airtight um, and tighten the lid, pop them in the fridge and, and you'll be able to pull bacteria out of those, those samples. And no long. biosecurity issues bringing these strange organisms back from Antarctica. Maybe back in, not, not back in the 80s there, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, there's always. We shouldn't go uh, there, perhaps. Yeah, look, um, there's probably more of an issue about that sort of thing now, but back then, because it would have been, it was part of um, a research facility and it was, it, it, they were samples taken by a university academic. You, you sign paperwork that, that mm. um, basically says, you know, I will, I'm, I'm a responsible researcher. My samples will be taken to the lab. They'll be used in the lab. And once I'm finished with them, I will, um, autoclave them or sterilize them before discarding mm. and that's pretty much the same process now um, and if we get on to one of the other projects that I in fact one of the one of the reasons I came to Australia to work on a particular project um, is, is we were working I was, at that stage I was working on petroleum microbiology and so in, there, in, New, in New Zealand you're working in that. no no so in Australia oh. Right. And, and we, had, we had oil and water samples from all around the world, <clears throat> but as long as they were collected in the right way, they were stored in the right way, shipped to us, then, then we could get permits to, to hold them. So hang on a minute. One minute you're in Antarctica, well you're not in Antarctica. You're, I, jumped, you're, I jumped ahead of you. You're in Hamilton and, and working on sulfur reducing bacteria from Antarctica, and the next minute you're working on Petroleum so sort of stuff. I'm working on sulfate reducing bacteria from oil high temperature oil fields. Okay, so you, you did. We had your master's uh, project, and you you then segued into a PhD yeah. on on these SRVs too. Yeah. Okay. By that time, you're hooked by these things. I'm well and I'm well and truly hooked on. And was your PhD, was your PhD similar to the the masters? Same 
same group of microbes, but what I was working on there was waste ponds, waste settling ponds from an abattoir. So rather than an environmental sample, what we were looking at was in some of these waste ponds that can be created, they generate lots of um, fat and fatty acids and mm -hmm. fat breakdown products. Mm -hmm. And what we were trying to find out was how and whether it was going to be possible for sulfate reducing bacteria to be part of that decomposition process of those, those um, fat breakdown products. So I, at, at that stage, I got a scholarship through one of the meat industry uh, research organizations in New Zealand and they funded me my PhD. So I went from water samples from a lake to going out to an abattoir every six months and, and like scooping fun. smelly, smelly, mm. fatty, gloopy mud. From, well, I, can, from I, can, I can see why you wanted to um, move into something a bit different and <laughs> in a petroleum, petroleum sort of, sort of stuff. So tell us a bit about how, so you, you applied for a, a job or something and, and where did you end up in Australia and, and had, what was that all about, this petroleum stuff? So um, I, I did do a small diversion. Um, mm -hmm. What I actually applied for, for a job, so once I finished my um, PhD, I applied for a postdoctoral research so job. So this is 1989? Yeah, so this is 89 now, we jumped 30, to 89. Yeah, long time ago. Um, and, and I got a, um, postdoctoral position at Monash University right. and and what that was all about was so they they were particularly interested in uh, microbial processes not the sulfur side of the story mm. but what we were developing there was a way of treating um, domestic effluent so sewage mm. domestic effluent and what we were trying to do there is develop ways where we could encourage microbes or bacteria to suck all of the phosphorus that's in domestic wastewater out of the wastewater into the cells and then we would harvest the cells and that way we would use a biological process to clean up the wastewater before it could get pumped out into the... Is this fairly, fairly um, innovative sort of stuff back 30 years ago or so? Was it being done very much around that time? So it was being done in two or three places around the world. Um, the, the process itself was actually um, first described and invented by a group in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of groups working on the process in Europe and there was a group in, um, in the States. And then there was this group in Melbourne um, and it was kind of a collective between us at Monash another group who were at CSIRO at the time and a colleague who was at La Trobe um, University. And so the basic idea of the process had kind of been developed, but what we were actually looking at there was trying to improve upon that process by getting a better understanding of the anaerobic bit of the process and how could we optimise the stuff that went on in the absence of oxygen, which everyone knew was pretty important to the process. Mm -hmm. It was known that if you created this anaerobic zone, the process would happen, but no one really knew why or how or what was going on. So we were really trying to pull that, 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 that black box as it was, yeah, yeah. pull it apart and find out what was in there. Okay. Um, so from there you, um, how did you end up in the, in the petroleum <laughs> stuff? I'm still, still not quite sure how that works. But, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Halfway. I'll actually, at the end of all of these, I'll, I'll, I'll pull all these threads together. Okay, um, that'd be nice. So I went, so, so I went from um, working with uh, abattoir waste mm -hmm. as my PhD to working with um, domestic effluent mm -hmm. for my first postdoc. Um, and then I got the job looking at um, hydrocarbon or petroleum microbiology. And back then, I guess there were two threads to the work. Mm -hmm. And that was because I always worked on decomposition and how microbes break down compounds and in, in wastewater and it, the chemistry and biochemistry in a lot of ways is quite similar. So in wastewater, it's human origin stuff you're trying to get rid of. Mm -hmm. 
um, and I had two projects there. One was about bioremediation. So when, when you get, for example, a, a spill, diesel spill over a, a paddock, there are various ways you can clean that up. But one of the things is bacteria can actually chomp away a lot of the compounds that are in diesel. Right. And in fact, um, bioremediation, trying to fix up these contaminated sites by using microbes that eat the stuff, um, is, is a very viable kind of process. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is stimulate the microbes to do it. So while it might seem a really strange thing to be working all of a sudden on bioremediation and petroleum, really the, the microbes are a core and, and it's, it's just yeah, I can see the link. It's carbon I can breakdown. See, yeah, I can see the link. It's, it's, yeah. it's all making sense to me now. I've never understood that before, but yeah, it's, there is method in your madness. It's yeah. Great. <laughs> and, and at the same time, we, that's, that's also the, the other half of that, that project was doing the oil field work because you know, I guess we had a, our, our lab had a broad interest in what, what went on at various stages of the, of the process. So we were looking at, at what happens when you've got your refined product and you contaminate it. And we also had a, had a whole range of projects saying, well, okay, when we get this stuff out of the ground, can it be contaminated? Um, what's, what are the issues associated with actually producing um, various hydrocarbon products? Mm -hmm. and, and, and microbial contamination can be a big problem um, with, with oil production, particularly offshore oil production. And so I, I, I delved into the world of oil fields uh, and looking at the various microbes that can grow in high temperature oil fields. All right, God. And how long did you do that for? uh four years right and um look i, I as i said at the beginning of this is i, I know you from the working sort of in freshwater systems and freshwater ecology um so was it the, that was that the next step in your that was the next step yeah amazing career um yeah. and so can you just take us through how how you got into that that so this is the early 90s at this stage is that right yeah so, yeah, mid nineties. Mid nineties. Mid nineties. Okay. Um, and and just take us through how you actually got into the freshwater world, the freshwater ecology world. Yeah. So look, you can you can see from everywhere each of those different things I've done with bacteria. Like the the, the common thread in, in all of that is is that it's bacteria transforming stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's organic material, whether it's whether it's fat in a pond. In, in a waste human made pond or whether it's oil leaking out the back of a truck, it's still microbes performing some biological function and doing things and breaking down stuff and transforming things. And um, so when I saw this job available for a microbiologist to do freshwater ecology, I, I didn't know a thing about freshwater science, but I knew about microbes and I knew what they could do. And so, I made this shift. Well, I ended up getting this, getting the job, which effectively is the one I'm still doing now. <clears throat> and um, I guess what I argued I could bring to the case was that I know a lot about how microbes work. I know uh, how they function. I know the sorts of things they can do with organic materials, but also because I knew about sulfate reduction, it also opened up the whole world of nitrogen and how nitrogen can be transformed by bacteria. And, and so bacteria are, are core to all of these processes and, and they're pretty fundamental to how rivers and wetlands operate. And really, I, there weren't very many microbially trained people working in fresh water when I started. Um, so what was the, what was the, climate and I don't mean the actual physical climate what, what was the the policy or um, priorities of the climate that, that would want a person like you working in that area now, so, why, what's the what's the motivation behind having uh, a microbiologist so what, uh, I think I think what it was and, and and I talked to a couple of the people at the time really what what they thought the gaps were and and i suppose historically this was my take on on how the freshwater world existed in australia as i say i i, I was new to it 
Mm. But what it was clear, it was clearly being driven out of departments where um, zoology or botany were the big threads. And mm -hmm. I would say probably zoology. So there were lots of freshwater people who knew everything about fish or macroinvertebrates or zooplankton. Yeah. Um, or, thought that, or, or thought they knew anyway. Or thought they knew until yeah. you came <laughs> on and showed them what they didn't they know. They were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really dominated by that kind of thinking. Yep. And, and when it came to, um, at that stage, people were really realising that rivers needed managing. It was the concepts, environmental flows were starting to come along. You know, how do we manage these systems? If we put water somewhere, um, what what's going to matter? What sort of things will actually be important? And, and a lot of the the current crop of, of um, freshwater scientists had a really good grasp on what the animals and that sort of things needed, but but not so much about okay, well if we we do this kind of thing to the environment, how how's that going to affect the water quality? How's that going to affect the food sources? How's that going? And all of I, I, I won't say all of it because there were there were algal physiology people around um, who knew a lot about algae and phytoplankton mm. and mm. that sort of thing. Mm. But how some of those sorts of processes all tied together, there were, weren't very many people looking but you at were, that. But you were, if I remember correctly, because I think I was there at the freshwater research center when you first arrived, um, you were predated by one Paul Boone, I think, who uh, was up in Albury at um, the Freshwater Research Centre for several years and then I think is now at the Victorian University of Technology from memory he may have moved on I'm not sure um, so there must have been some realization prior prior to you turning up that and I, yeah. I remember him doing remember there was a, some some quite interesting papers about methanogenesis I think back yeah. then yeah. yeah yeah so Paul actually um, if you you look at the the material that's published around that time on freshwater science in Australia. Paul um, actually was the dominant voice. Um, he had a very well, loud voice. Saying, he was... has a very loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> Can't yeah. show him up. So look, I'm not saying there wasn't, there was, wasn't, yeah. there was no yeah. work done, but it, it, it was a very limited, there was a very limited number of people doing it. And in fact, Paul, Paul was one of the, the main players and he did some of the really interesting and important uh, work with how carbon moves around in wetlands, the effects of drying on some of those wetlands, how that changes the biochemistry and the, 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 the post drying effects. And he really did a lot of the very first stuff in, in Australian and systems. Was it, and was any of this um, precipitated, uh, his work and your work precipitated or at least motivated partly because of the thousand kilometre long algal bloom in the Darling in 91 from memory that, that, that really got people worried and uh, spurred on people to, to, to formulate the Murray Lane Basin cap uh, and, 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 and made them concerned about over allocations of water generally. Was that an influence on anything for you or, or your type of work, Paul Burns type of work? That, that, that did actually influence um, the sorts of work that was going on at the time. Interestingly enough, I was still doing my wastewater work when that bloom happened. And the thing we were trying to do in our wastewater work was to understand what would actually happen if you could reduce the amount of phosphorus that went into the environment. So what actually happened with the, um, at the time, the big bloom, it was mm -hmm. realised the role that nutrients played. And around about that time, there was a big funding um, push, as tends to be the way our funding cycles tend to operate mm -hmm. in Oz. Um, there was a big uh, funding push to understand uh, nutrients, nutrients, sources, how they were metabolized, how they were moved around in the environment to try and understand and potentially reduce the extent that these big blooms actually happen. Because that, that like you're saying at the beginning of this discussion, is that those Lurigan algae that we're talking about in the Darling, that, that cyanobacteria? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's stuff you know about. Yeah, and, and, and even if it's not cyanobacteria, so not all algal blooms are cyanobacterial algal blooms. Mm -hmm. um, there are other green algal blooms that can actually happen. Are those green and, algae, are they, are they 
Uh, true algae or are they bacteria? They're true algae. They're okay. true algae. And when they, when they bloom and they basically get out of control and you have explosions in the population, um, the water goes pretty, well, I guess the easiest way to describe it is pretty manky. You know, it's, it's coloured, it's um, not good quality, it's is it can toxic? Be slightly flavoured. It's, it it's, it's a problem um, for, you know, infrastructure and that sort of thing, having it, but it's not toxic. It's the cyanobacteria that produce the toxic L, the, the toxins. Okay. So when it comes to blooms, the, the, the really pointy ones, so green ones have their own issues um, and people don't mm. sort of like the idea of swimming in green water. But you actually could swim in a, in a, a soup that had green algae there and, and it wouldn't really affect you. You don't really want to do that though if they're cyanobacteria because they're the ones that produce the toxins, the, the skin toxins or the liver toxins. So, I mean, green algae is, you know, the stuff that some people swallow in great amounts. Um, spirulina. Yeah, spirulina. Is that, yeah, that's a, spirulina is that the green algae? Is that the green alga? Yeah. Okay, so there are some which some people think are good for you. Yeah. Not just not toxic, but actually good for you. But yeah, yeah. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be suggesting to do that with green algal blooms in, in rivers, though, to put that on your wheat pix in the morning. Well, you, well, you might, inadvert you might inadvertently put on your wheat pix if you <laughs> turn the wrong tap on, perhaps. The funny, the funny thing, is, though, is, is there are always algae. There are always algae in, in waterways. And if you look, if you look at um, the water, the rivers here tend to be turbid. They tend to have a lot of sediment and they've kind of got that brownish colour to them. So there's always sediment in the river. Um, but there are always algae because mm -hmm. algae, in a lot of circumstances, in, in, in a lot of situations, they're like, how can I liken it? They're, they're, they're like the, the grass on a paddock. Mm -hmm. that, that's often one of the primary sources of um, production in a, in a river. And they are one of the big sources of, of actual primary production in a river. So if we didn't have them, there wouldn't be all this sort of stuff. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a functioning river. Yeah. 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 So and so when you go we swimming in the river, river any time and you happen to open your mouth a little bit, you will gulp down a mouthful of, but the, of green the, algae. The fact that we don't, the, our rivers aren't green all the time is just because of the low concentrations of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So back to the... Um, Where are we? The, the, well, hang on, hang on. So I was just saying that um, I was asking about the, um, the, some of the motivations for wanting people like yourself and Paul Boone in working in freshwater whether that was in um, partly because of um, algal blooms in, in rivers and things, but there, are, there was obviously more to it than just that because there'd been a perceived dominance of um, fishy and buggy types and plant, big plant types, but, um, but not so much at that, that lower yeah. level. And, and at the time, one of the, one of the big things that, that we were really starting to do is um, trying to work as I say, it was, it, was, it was also just understanding how rivers function. Now, we, we've got rough ideas and we've known roughly along the lines of you know, algae are a base source and they're eaten by zooplankton and zooplankton are eaten by higher level invertebrates and yep. they're eaten by small fish and big fish. Yep, yep, yep. But what, what we've never really known is to what extent that happens, how important those processes are. You know, the, the rates that some of these things actually happen. Um, and then, of course, on the side of that, you've got, well, what are some of the other sources of, of, of food that can be in, in a river? Mm -hmm. um, you've got different environments in the river. So you've got the water column itself, the bottom sediments. Mm -hmm. But, of course, attached to every log and every tree, everyone will have seen the slime that grows on those. So that material there is a mixture of bacteria and algae and sediment washing fungi all sorts of things and yeah there'll be some fungi in there um, so i'm just showing you, how showing how knowledgeable i am by adding <laughs> something in there so when, when you put all of that together um it, it's it's so well, what what are the really important steps and what are the what are the important parts of the process and if we we pull some environmental management lever what effects that going to have to the different components and so there was a real push to try and understand how rivers actually function, what are the key steps, um, how important is flooding and having materials from floodplains put into rivers and how important was it to move heights up and down and all these sorts of things. So 
to do that, there were, it involved a whole lot of um, processes where microbes are key to the whole story because they're actually generating a lot of, a lot of the food resources. And so, you know, one of the earliest things that I had, I, I took on as one of the, the jobs and projects was to try and understand how big that was in the, the overall scheme of the things. Uh, you know, you've given lectures for me before to my um, river and ecology students. And um, you talk about some of the sort of origins of uh, microbial food webs being from the oceans. Uh, and can you remind me the name of that? Uh, the, one of the key players in that. What was his name? So the um, the ocean the ocean food web microbial loop was developed by a chap by the name of Pomeroy. That's it, Pomeroy. Yeah. yeah. And and so but and so um, was part of what you were looking at is whether the the, the similar types of processes at at the magnitudes that they found in in marine systems were operating in freshwater as well? Yeah, and yeah, so we were trying, we were trying to measure how important that process was as a driver. Is it just the microbes? <clears throat> the microbes are kind of there doing their own thing, not making much of a contribution, or is what the microbes doing a really big part of, of the story and, and not knowing how the microbial side of things. So tell us how much, on. so tell us um, just, because I'm sure people are interested in how much they were contributing to what Pomeroy found in terms of their, their contribution to marine systems. So, so in oceans, it's really high. Um, most of the, so if you, if you were to measure that metabolic activity, you, me you measure the amount of respiration that's going on, you measure those kind of processes. Mm. Most of it, you know, greater than 50, greater than 70% actually sort of happens microscopically. So uh, whales and whales and they're, 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 a, small, and they're a small part of the squid and yeah, like, a small part of the process. Even I mean, even though their biomass is in, is enormous, yeah. the um the biomass or the, the contribution of bacteria is seventy percent or something. Yeah. So even though whales, as an as an individual, are pretty big, yeah, relative to a, a microbe. If you counted up the number of whales, for example, in the ocean, um, but then you you calculated the number of bacteria and, and um, algae or phytoplankton that are in a litre of water and multiply that by the volume of water in the oceans, you get quite a big number. So with biomass uh, weight, essentially, of, of these things, yeah. it's more important than, than numbers, really, isn't it, ultimately? Yeah. 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 And they're constantly growing and turning over as, as an important food source for um, zooplankton, which are then, then feed up through the-, the Okay, food. so Pomeroy um, and presumably people who followed um, came up with this. And so this was fairly revolutionary perhaps, probably, uh, I'm, I'm suspecting, but um, you, you and others investigated this in fresh water. Did you, did you actually come up you or others come up with actual numbers of percentages in fresh water? Yeah, so um, one of the things we could do, some of the earliest estimates we got that I, I remember getting was at least a third. So a third of all of the respiration that you could detect and produce um, was going through a microbial sort of cycle. So just, just tell me briefly, how do you work it out? Because there's all <laughs> there's all these other things, these macroinvertebrates and microinvertebrates and algae and yeah. and fish and other things in water. How do you actually go about working out the um, the respiration that's con contributed by by bacteria by microbes? So that's yeah, that's was that too hard to answer? No, no, no. Um, the way the way that people have done that is is that you've got to come up with some kind of way of doing or measuring like an entire aggregated um, respiration mm -hmm. um, and then, then so that's just purely production of oxygen is that production of oxygen yeah which gives you an indication of what respiration but what total amount yeah so basically so it just means the process is going yeah. on within organisms yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so if you if you um so what what we actually do is is we put um oxygen 
um, probes, they measure the oxygen concentration. If we put, we put a, a oxygen probe into a water column, mm -hmm. um, during the day, as photosynthesis happens, then the amount of oxygen in the water goes up slightly. Mm -hmm. And then at night time when it's dark, all of the respiration, there's, there's no more photosynthesis, and so the, the dissolved oxygen comes down again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as the light comes along, it goes up again. So yeah. if you actually look at the dissolved oxygen in any water body, particularly in a river, you'll see it just doing this constantly. Right. Yep. And so the, the downward slope is the amount of respiration. Now that's happening at night time, but it's also happening during the day. That's why you take day. flowers out of hospital rooms at night, don't you? <laughs> Well, that's what they used to do. Did you know that? <laughs> no, I didn't know that. That's right. That's the back in the good old days. You took nurses took um, any flowers out of hospital rooms at night time. Serious. This is serious. This is clinical <laughs> um, because they, there was concern that they would um, they would respire at night and use up the oxygen in the, because these rooms supposedly were so hermetically sealed that there was no oxygen coming through any other way. Right. That's, that's my they understanding. Didn't, they didn't think about the, the patients on the bed consuming any of the oxygen. Well, they did, <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't want any flowers competing with them. Competing with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry to them. But it... <laughs> so in, in, a, in a nutshell is that that amount of respiration that actually happens that you measure in a water column, we, we recognize that that is the, respiration that is accounting for everything that's respiring in that water. Mm -hmm. So the fish are contributing to it, the bugs, the biofilms, every thing within that packet of water is mm -hmm. driving that down at night. And then the algae are pushing it up in the day and then it's coming down at night. So what you can do is some cute mathematics and then pull apart those two bits of the curve, the up and the down, and you can sort of say, well, how much photosynthesis happening, how much respiration is happening. And that gives you those two numbers. Mm -hmm. And then you can take away, one of the things you can do with microbes is you can kind of isolate them from the rest of the, the water column. So we can take a water sample and then we can manipulate that in a certain way. And we can say, well, we know the bacteria are doing this much of it. So then you can say, well, if that was the total, the bacteria are doing that proportion of it. So so from that you worked out about a third of yeah and then they were like they were really first numbers um that that probably didn't take into consideration lots of other aspects of the river because we were really doing this sort of stuff for the first time um, and we were basing it around work that was being done in new zealand and in the states at the time but other than that there weren't very many people who were really trying this this approach to, to measuring um the role of, of microbes in, in respiration so when you say 33 percent or something plus or minus i mean you know your, your, your figures must have been fairly hairy i mean it must be hard to oh that was spot on <laughs> <laughs> because i mean you presumably you go to one spot you might get 10 yeah. percent. another spot you might get 90 percent or something yeah so like I've got to talk in ballpark numbers. Yeah, so sure, yeah, you, sure, you sure. would you would um you do those sorts of measurements on lots of different occasions. Um and of course once once we know where we're going with the method, you can actually start interrogating the question like a little bit more. So back in those back when we were first starting, we didn't really know much about it. So we were measuring at two or three different places in the river. So we, we now or back then, I should say, we, we had samples where we were taking them from near Albury, which is a reasonably clean part of the river. The mm -hmm. water here is, for the most part, what mm -hmm. comes out of the dam. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing it around Barmer Forest, where the water in the river there has had a long part of the river to flow down and pick up nutrients and things to grow, but also got influences of the forests. And then also further down the river, um, around near Mildura. And so, are kind of averaging the story here just to keep it keep it a little bit simple but but in some sections of the river yeah, we found out that you know bacterial production is was was less of a, a proportion but in, in other sections it was much bigger now my 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 sort of reading of some of the the, the work by people like um jbc jackson and, and others in in marine systems inshore marine systems with um looking at food webs and 
traffic cascades and things is that when things start to go pear-shaped and uh, the, the contribution of bacteria to that, the whole system goes up. Um, so I'd be curious to know whether that's, that's I'm summarizing that or whether I'm actually just making it up. Um, but is, uh, so I'll, I'll frame the question is, is if you get a greater percentage of uh, respiration contributed food webs, essentially, I suppose, by bacteria in, in a system like, like the, the Murray, is that something that we should be concerned about because that indicates that the, the quality of the system is, is compromised? Or is it just natural to have that? So, um, Was that a simple, it, stupid question? No, 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 it's, it's a reasonable question because there, there's one, one particular example where it can be catastrophic if it gets too high. Um, but other than that, so, so the role of bacteria mopping up carbon and nutrients and growing and doing their thing um, <clears throat> is really is, is pretty important. And as, as, as we, for example, probably the best example to, to explain how well this might work is with black water. Now, a lot of people have heard of black water. Tell us what it is. And, and for those who haven't heard of black water, <coughs> is that with a lot of floodplains and river edges and benches with the trees, they drop litter onto the, onto the surface. When you wet that litter, so this is leaves and twigs leaves, and, leaves all that sort and twigs of stuff. and yeah. grass and the yeah. leaves so are not litter like that we you don't you no, might no, no. no. It's not, not cigarette butts or, okay. <laughs> or um, cardboard cartons from your favorite takeaway yep. dealer. <laughs> yep. Um so leaf litter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so what, what then happens is as those dry materials get wet, they leach out all of this brown, brown colored, complicated um all mix of organic compounds you know it's like a soup of organic material mm -hmm. and a lot of that stuff is really used a lot by bacteria now it's a pretty normal process but what it does do is it colors the water so the water then takes on this sort of dark brown or sometimes so, tannins, tannins is an tannins yeah, it, example tannins, of that. yeah which it's, makes it's your tea same, it's the yeah. same process as making tea yeah or red wine just, or happy happening on a happening on a on a riverine scale yep. and and what can actually happen is if you put some of that material into the river which would normally happen mm. it becomes food for microbes the microbes grow then they can become food for zooplankton because basically carbon isn't it it's basically yeah, yeah. it's all it's yeah. carbon and nitrogen and, yeah. and anything that's left over and and leaves yeah yeah yep. so if that material makes it into a waterway or a wetland um it, it, it then becomes part of the food web so it's in that sense it's a good thing um, and and one of the one of the things that's actually happened over the you know years of management is we've actually reduced the degree with which that process happens simply by not flooding things as often or or not flooding them for periods of time so we've altered that part of the the, the process so that leaf litter builds up over long yeah, periods of time. Yeah, leaf can build up and, and that sort of thing, yeah. Mm. Now, if, if you see that kind of process happening, some people would look at it and go, oh, that's not very good, that's bad. Um, the microbe activity will shoot up. Mm -hmm. Respiration will really increase. Um, but as long as it doesn't get out of hand, if I can mm. put it that way, mm. um, and one of the big things that will actually stop that process getting out of hand is the temperature that it actually occurs at because bacteria are really strongly controlled by temperature right. um, which is why we put things in the fridge so as soon as you leave milk on yeah. the bench it won't last as long as if you stick it in the fridge that makes so sense. if um if those sort of things happen at periods where it's not really hot in the water then all the other natural processes that go on keep the water oxygenated so you know photosynthetic can occur synthesis can occur mixing can occur mm -hmm. And, and what will go on there is the bacteria will chomp away at some of this carbon. They will then become food for the food web and, and in effect, increase the amount of food that's going into the food web. But don't most of our, our high flows occur during the cooler months? So, is, so in other words, we don't have to worry about the warm temperatures so much? 
You don't have to worry about the warm temperatures unless you get um, a, uh, a late spring flow mm -hmm. or you get a managed flow or you manipulate your environment in such a way that you, you um, carry out one of these processes in the warmer periods of the, the year. So okay. it, it could be if, if you um, chose, for example, you could do one of these watering events um, or you could carry out this kind of work, you know, in a creek or anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. In the summer months, when um, the river temperatures are high or the creek temperatures are high, and what you will find there is that microbes now go crazy and they mm -hmm. grow really, really fast. Mm -hmm. They suck the oxygen out of the water really, really fast, and the water becomes anaerobic or anoxic or hypoxic. These are all just different words for saying not very much oxygen left in the water and, and higher organisms really can't survive or they don't like it. That's where we, we get fish kills and see and crayfish walking out. That's when, you get, that's when you get fish kills caused by black water. Yeah. Okay. So is all black water bad? No. In that sense? No. No. It no. can be can be dark coloured but not but still have oxygen in it. That's 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 right. So if you look in um, there are some some quite noted rivers, uh, tannin rich rivers in Tasmania. They look quite yes. fantastic. They're really quite a dark black. I've, I've worked in um, the, some of these creeks were um, draining into Lake Pedder, actually, were yeah. beautiful, beautiful colour, absolutely beautiful. Because yeah. it was quartz um, substrate on the uh, on these creeks and these lovely sort of tea coloured creeks, beautiful. And and in those systems, the you know, the black water is is, is part of what it is. But again, because of the temperature, because of the mixing, because of the, the the way the water is turned over. The water's always oxygenated. It's just got it's got a lot of organic material sitting in it. Yeah. For so no systems, up for discussion. Okay. Um, look, I'm, we're, I mean, we'd be going for more than an hour now. Would you believe? That's just. I mean, I, yeah, no. And I could I could be be happy to talk to you for a, a lot longer than this. And maybe we'll do another one too. Um, I want, I think I might finish off with with you've got three three options. You're going to choose two of three options that I'm going to give you. The first one, which I don't think is um, uh, you can say no to, is where do you think the next big thing in in microbiology and freshwaters is? is? So I'll, I'll give you a bit of you know warning about what the other two are. The second thing is, um, uh, do you have a, a microbiological joke for us um, so that you can think about that? And the third one, so you've got to choose two of three, but the first one is non-negotiable. Is um, is there a microbiologically uh, inspired um, trombone piece of music? Because I know that you're a trombonist. So, which which of those? You're going to do the first one, but you can choose either the, the microbiology joke or um, tell us a little bit about um, some relationship between microbiology and, and trombone compositions. Yeah. So let's go with the first one. What's the what, in your opinion, uh, what's one of the big issues that we'll be we'll be seeing in your area in the next few years? And don't, you don't have to give anything away because you're probably going to be applying for research grants on this sort of area. No, no. So from from the the microbial side of things, and, and in fact, other areas of biology have caught on to the similar sort of things. One of the, one of the things that you tend to do if you're a microbiologist, you tend to do a lot of molecular biology. You tend to do a lot of DNA based stuff simply because bacteria are too small to see that you know, they're, they're kind of more awkward to work with in lots of different ways. And so you, you tend to do a bit of stuff with bacteria that involves DNA and that's really become quite a, an area of active work and, and application and we, we're doing that along with quite a number of other people now is where instead of looking for, for certain bacteria and, and and now you know I've got colleagues and we, I guess we're doing a similar sort of thing as rather than going out and looking and hunting and collecting animals and plants like we used to we're now in a position where we can go out and take water samples and the eDNA environmental and DNA the DNA yeah, yeah. and it this thing called eDNA, environmental DNA, is, is part of that. So look, there's there's still a lot of things that have to be done um, to to get some of those methods to being routine. Um, at this stage, they 
don't do everything. So you, th there's some stuff you will only ever find out by understanding the actual animal themselves. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but that's a different question. So if, if your question is about looking for things or looking for invasive species or hard to find species, or you need to get maps or fingerprints of who's there or what's there, then, then DNA is, is a good way of doing it. Yep. And those methods now are just being refined and, and in the half a dozen years I've been working in that area, it's just exploded. The so tech has become so cheaper. It, technology, it, dri technology is driving the, um, yeah, the yeah. science in some ways. Yeah, and, and a lot of it, fortunately, you know, fortunately, environmental scientists are, are, are um, benefiting from, from the um, medical world. So okay. huge amounts of money is, is invested into a lot of DNA sequencing and sequencing mm -hmm. technologies, and, and a lot of that stuff is actually happening. Um, so and fil that's, filtering down. Yeah, yeah, and we, we basically... Um, taking taking some of those technologies and the tools and the machines and saying, well, we can actually do that and, and use a different kind of sample. Great. So I, I think some of those, over the next however many years, number of years, um, what we will probably see some of those techniques come in as, as a lot more routine. Um, and cheaper. Very cheap. Yeah, cheaper, quicker, can actually, when they work, they tell you a whole lot more than some of the other techniques. You know, you can you can you can identify hundreds and hundreds of different things from from a spoonful of, of soil um, in two days work um, you can you know get maps of all the fungi that are in, in soils or you can look for you know contaminant organisms or those sorts of things so that that young Gavin Reese back in the 80s working dreaming of of the stomachs of cows back in, <laughs> in, in Hamilton New Zealand you couldn't you would never have even um, dreamed of, of such technological advances in those days, it would have been a... Well, back, back then, so microbiologists have been doing DNA-based identifications for a long time. And when I was a PhD student, that's when it was really coming to the fore. And, and back, okay. back, back then, um, you know, you would do the classic ways of identifying an organism by growing it and seeing what it did and sorts of conditions. But because bacteria are quite easy to do DNA sequences, it was soon realized that if you sequence this particular gene, you actually get a lot of taxonomic, taxonomic information. Mm -hmm. So bacteria were the first to be categorized based on, on DNA sequences. Okay, so, so just the way we're doing things and they're... Yeah. The application and the ease and all that sort of stuff is yeah. really good. Cool. That, that used to be that used to be the major part of trying to identify uh, an organism. It would be really expensive. In some cases, it was it had you had to send samples to an expert lab. They would extract this particular DNA and they would sequence these this particular gene. It would take you weeks to get it back, um, and then you'd potentially be charged. And everything was like that. Tens though. of thousands of dollars. Everything, even, even pre computer type stuff, you were just yeah. being a paper published in those days. All right, um, so your last thing are you going to tell us a joke or are you going to tell us something about trombones and microbiology? Do you, know, do you have any microbiological jokes? Come on, you must have one. I haven't, I haven't a clue. I've never, I don't really know any microbiological jokes. Plus, I'm not really a joke teller. So. That's, that's okay. Um, you're funny in other in other ways, and no no bio, uh, microbiologically inspired trombone. You haven't written a piece about bacteria or anything. No, can't can't say no no. I haven't I haven't I haven't really delved into the well. I think the microbes. I think there's some homework for homework for you for both of these um these for the next interview when we do that because um, I think that's going to make a. a a, a sign-off piece from now on is we has to tell a joke. I should give you, I should have given you some warning so you could look it up on internet or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I could be quickly looking up here and getting a. Did you hear the one about? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll we'll wait for that for a second. One. That'll be something that people can wait for. Um, look, thanks very much, Gavin. It's been really interesting. I'm, I'm, we could talk for a lot longer about this. I mean, I I know almost nothing about um, the microbiological world. I'm just a work on things that you can see and feel and touch and fry up in a pan and then eat later on. But 
it's been really good. So thank you for that. And um, we'll catch up another, another time. Thanks. No, it's been good. It's been All good. right. See ya. See ya.